Turn circles and turning room are two important concepts to understand when you're solving dogfighting problems using BFM, so we'll go through those now. The turn circle is the path an airplane makes when it's turning, and it will do this at a certain turn radius and turn rate. The turn radius will define the size of the turn circle, and the turn rate will determine how fast the airplane moves around the circle. Turn radius and turn rate are both functions of airspeed and the g-force supplied in the turn. So in a level turn, the g-force needed to keep altitude depends on the bank angle. So in the highlighted example, with a bank angle of 60 degrees, you're going to need to maintain 2 g's of force to stay in the level turn. This will give you a turn rate of 13 degrees a second with a radius of 340 meters if your airspeed is 270 km per hour. There are two types of turn rate. There's instantaneous, which is the maximum rate for a given airspeed while losing energy, and then there's sustained turn rate. This is the maximum rate while conserving energy. So we're going to have a look at this in a little more detail and I've created what's called an EM diagram um, using Microsoft Excel using some math and graphing techniques to help illustrate these points. Right, I know this looks kind of complicated initially but what we're going to do is we're going to build a graph for the BF109 step by step and hopefully by the end it'll all start making sense. So to start off on the Y axis we're graphing the turn rate in degrees per second and on the X axis we're graphing true airspeed in kilometers per hour and everything in the middle there shaded in green this is what we're overlaying the airplane's performance on. So now we'll look at an example of how to read it. This point, point A, is on the 4G line at 350 kilometers per hour. This will give you a turn radius of 250 meters and a turn rate of 22 degrees per second. So this graph with this one point will give us four important pieces of information about our turn performance. All right, so now that we understand how to read this graph, we're going to implement the BF109's performance over the top, but what we need to understand is that when you do the testing, everything has to be under the same test conditions, because the data we're going to see is only valid under these conditions, and those are up there on the top right. If you do testing between multiple airplanes under the same conditions, then you can make valid comparisons. So the first thing we look at is the max airspeed and level flight. And for the BF109, it was around 547 kilometers per hour, and it's represented by the purple line. The next thing we look at is the upper G limit. So this can be a structural limit, or it can be a limit on the pilot, depending on which is more limiting. In this case, the pilot's going to be limited by the G-force he can apply to himself, because the structural limit is higher. So in this case, I made the assumption that the 109 pilot can't pull more than 6 Gs, because he doesn't have a G-suit. So the next part we look at is calculated from the airplane's 1G stall speed, and this is called the lift limit. This is the maximum G you can pull for a given airspeed, and what this means for you is that if you're pulling more G than the given airspeed will allow you to, you'll enter an accelerated stall. So if you look where the lift limit meets the upper G limit, this is called your corner airspeed. This is the minimum airspeed you can generate maximum G. And this is a very important airspeed to know because it's at this point you can create your maximum turn rate and minimum turn radius. So let's say you're flying slower than corner airspeed and you're trying to pull 4G. This is actually less G than you could pull if you were at corner airspeed, but the airplane will enter an accelerated stall. On the other hand, if you're flying faster than corner airspeed, you're actually restricted by your upper G limit. This will have a negative effect on your turn radius and your turn rate. So if you were trying to pull more G than the upper limit allows in order to keep a higher turn rate, you could induce a pilot blackout, or you can end up causing structural failure if that was related to your upper limit. So now we're going to overlay the 109 sustained turn data onto the graph. This data was obtained by testing under those conditions in the top right, and we flew circles and timed how long it took to complete 360 degrees multiple times, and we averaged them out, and this is the data that you see here. What you'll notice with this data is that there's a trend upwards on the turn rate up until the point it meets the lift limit. So where the sustained turn data and the lift limit meet is known as the best sustained turn airspeed. In the 109 this is around 270 km per hour. So what this means for the 109 pilot is that he doesn't want to fly slower than 270 because what ends up happening is it will cause a decrease in his turn rate and an increase in his turn radius. So it's going to hurt his turn performance. That pretty much covers what I wanted to talk about with these diagrams, so I hope they've helped you understand it a little bit better. The cool thing is you can actually overlay multiple airplanes onto these and see who does better at what aspect. But for now, we're going to have a look at the 109 at this in practice. 
So what we're doing here is starting out at 500 kilometers per hour, which is above our corner airspeed. So as we begin the turn, we'll bring the power back to idle and begin a high G turn to bleed off energy till we reach that corner airspeed. And then we're going to increase the power to maximum so we can maintain that high airspeed with a high turn rate all the way around through the turn. Then eventually we're going to settle at our best sustained turn rate and we'll try and hold there. We're going to bring the power back to idle and initiate a high G turn. By doing this we're losing our energy in the form of airspeed by increasing our G. You can see ourselves starting to black out. As we're approaching the corner airspeed we bring the power all the way up to our maximum. This way we can try and keep our airspeed high. This is going to keep us having a nice high turn rate as we come around the corner. And then as we start getting slower we begin approaching the best sustained turn airspeed. We'll relax the bank hang a little bit and the back pressure. And this way we can maintain that 270 to 300 kilometers per hour coming around. And we can just hold that there as necessary. Now you may have noticed that because it was a level turn, we weren't able to maintain that corner airspeed. So in order to do that, you need to sacrifice altitude. To avoid an attack, defenders may need to brake turn and slow down to start reducing their turn radius. This is because a better turning airplane can't use its advantage until it's inside of your turn circle. So you need to maintain as much G as possible to minimize your turn radius, and don't forget, you can also use gravity to help with that when you're in the vertical. If you have a turn radius advantage, as an attacker, you find it easier to be in lead pursuit for a gunshot, and if you're a defender, you find it easier to force an overshoot or a reversal. For turn rate, every airplane turns best at its own corner airspeed. World War II airplanes can't sustain their corner airspeed in level turns though, as they're thrust limited, but modern jets can in some cases. By sacrificing altitude, this is going to allow you to maintain the corner airspeed on the way down. But it's important to know your best sustained turn airspeed as well, if you can't give up any altitude. However, no matter what speed you're at, you need to be able to pull enough G to attain the performance benefit. And it's better to have a turn rate advantage, because this will allow you to solve and create BFM problems faster. So as we bring up the overlay, in the red, this is where we've reached around 450 km per hour and we're slowing down, with a bank angle of over 70 degrees and a wide turn radius of over 210 meters. As we pull into the level turn, we slow down to between 270 and 300. This will give us a bank angle of around 70 degrees and a turn radius of around 210 meters, and we've slowed down to our best sustained turn rate. So what we see here is that I don't have any altitude left to sacrifice. So if I maintain the same amount of G throughout the turn, as my airspeed decreases, my turn radius is going to decrease until I get down to my best sustained turn airspeed, which I can maintain for the best turn rate and a small turn radius. Turning room is the separation in any plane of motion which attackers can use to achieve an offensive position by managing their range, angles, and closure, and defenders can use to create problems in range, angles, and closure for attackers to solve. The more maneuverable an airplane is, the less turning room it needs. The two types of turning room are either in-plane or out-of-plane, and we'll look at those now. In-plane turning room is used while turning vertically or horizontally with the bandit, but only if you're in the bandit's plane of motion. If you want to stay inside of the bandit's turn, this will require you to get better turning performance out of your aircraft, but this can result in a higher energy bleed. So if you need to, you can use lag pursuit or out of plane turning room in order to maintain your offensive position. The amount of in plane turning room you get is determined by the bandit's turn. If he turns away from you, that's going to increase the amount of in plane room available to you. But if he's turning into you, that's actually going to decrease your turning room available. Out of plane turning room is what you find outside of the bandit's plane of motion. It's often used if you're in an airplane with a higher or lower energy state or if that airplane has worse turning performance. It allows you to improve your position better than solely using in-plane maneuvering because you're converting energy instead of just bleeding it off. Whenever you use out-of-plane turning room, it's called out-of-plane maneuvering. The factors you need to think about are your relative energy state. So if you're low on energy, turning room underneath can provide energy for an attacking position, and if you're high on energy, you can go above, and this will let you climb and continue an attack afterwards. Recognizing when an aircraft enters the turn circle is critical because it helps you determine what BFM will work in that given situation, so we'll look at those visual cues now. If you're in a defensive turn, the band that's outside your turn circle when his aspect increases and line of sight moves forward. If he's inside your turn circle, you can't increase the aspect anymore and line of sight begins moving aft. 
The transition occurs when the boundary line of sight is stationary before it begins moving aft on your canopy. So now we'll have a look at how these defensive cues look from inside the cockpit. Here we are in a defensive position against the bandit with a high amount of separation, so there's a high amount of turning room available. As he comes down, I'm going to initiate a brake turn into him, apply G and bring him forward on the canopy. By doing this, I'm trying to deny him turning room as he gets closer to my turn circle, which we can see as he becomes stationary on the canopy. Then as he begins moving aft on the canopy, he's entered our turn circle and we look at his range angles and closure. If he's at a low range with a high aspect and high closure, it can warrant a reversal. Otherwise, we can continue turning or we can extend and bug out. In this example, because the bandit entered my turn circle with a high aspect and high closure with a low amount of in-plane turning room, he would have been better off using out-of-plane manoeuvring instead of trying to stay in plane with me. So now we'll show this in real time so we can see how fast it all happens. So here he comes, we're going to initiate our brake turn to the right, then we're going to bring him forward on the canopy by applying G to deny him turning room. He comes forward and starts moving aft, telling us he's entered the turn circle with a high aspect and high closure, so we know we've denied him turning room as he enters our turn circle. If you're on the offensive, you're going to be outside the bandit's turn circle when its aspect increases, line of sight is stable on the horizon, or if his turn will put you ahead of his 3-9 line. You'll be inside the bandit's turn circle when his aspect will stabilise and line of sight increases across the horizon, and his turn can't put you ahead of his 3-9 line. So now we'll look at the turn circle cues for offensive BFM. Here we are in a position of advantage, we're going to dive down. As the bandit begins his turn, He's going to rotate in position and his aspect will increase. Now as we enter the transition point, the aspect will stabilize and his line of sight rate across the horizon will get faster. It's at this point when we've arrived inside of his turn circle and then we can use our BFM to kill him. So now watching this in real time, you're going to begin a diving attack. As he begins his turn, he's going to rotate in position, aspect increases, We'll see the line of sight pick up across the horizon. We've entered his turn circle and aspect will start decreasing. Entering the turn circle correctly requires you to fly towards the bandit's entry window in Lake Pursuit. The closer your entry is to the center of the turn circle, the more out of plane turning room you're going to need to avoid overshooting. Now, if you recall from the intro to geometry video, your initial goal in BFM is to arrive in a position where you can control the fight, and a good turn circle entry is part of that. So now we'll look at how to enter the turn circle and those visual cues for offensive BFM. In this example, we're only going to use in-plane turning room. So as we come down and attack the bandit, he's going to initiate a break turn to the left. As he starts moving across the horizon per our turn circle cue, we're going to allow our nose to drift into lag pursuit towards his entry window. Once we're there, we're going to cut the power and we'll initiate a high G turn that's going to bleed off our airspeed to bring us down to corner airspeed. At this point, we can utilize our turning room for offensive BFM and we can evaluate if the band is outperforming us, in which we can disengage, or we outperform him and we continue the attack. In this example, we're going to utilize out of plane turning room. So we're going to dive down on the bandit and begin an attack, and he's going to do a break turn to the right. So as we're approaching the bandit, we can allow our nose to drift into lag pursuit towards the entry window. Then we can bring it up out of plane into the vertical, since he's turning horizontally, converting our kinetic energy into potential energy. Then we can use that potential, coming back down, converting it into airspeed, to continue our attack further. This out of plane maneuver is what you would know as a high yo yo. By understanding the turn circle and turning room, this will help you get into a better position initially to use BFM against the bandit, which is, of course, what will be covered in the future. So if you like this video, let me know with a like button or a comment. Also, don't forget to be a subscriber and to select the bell icon so this way you can be notified when a new video comes out. If the bell icon is not used, then YouTube won't notify you.